I think most of us know Veda Narayan and Vedanta, and he's called as Veda. Uh, Veda has helped uh, to build and grow multiple digital products and brands across health tech, ed tech, online travel, and so on. He possesses a varied mix of global experiences uh, spanning digital marketing, brand consulting, product management, and business development. He has worked previously with Razorpay, Healthify Me, Simply Lane, PayPal, to name a few. And now he is uh, heading the market. He is the marketing leader at Microsoft. Veda is also a marketing man. Bangalore, Indore, Kashipur, University of Vermont, and uh, uh, also he conducts programs on digital marketing, mobile marketing, influencer marketing, service marketing, product marketing, and so on. He was a speaker at digital conference worldwide. He has been a speaker at Arab e-commerce summit at Dubai, ETL Asia, strategy planning innovation summit at New York, digital marketing innovation summit at uh, SFO San Francisco. Asian Strategic Leadership Institute Tourism Summit at Kuala Lumpur, uh, Scandinavian New Business Summit at uh, Sweden, and so on. So he's a very speaker with immense knowledge and uh, in, uh, you know, um, capability. He is a graduate from INSEED Singapore CMO Academy, a member of uh, India CMO Council Advisory Board, and a graduate from India's top by school, uh, top business school, you know, SPJIMR Mumbai. And uh, I think none better than Veda is good for us to talk about the influence of marketing. Veda, over to you. I've been, uh, you know, uh, have listened to you a couple of times earlier with Kesam and Chai, and uh, happy to be again here, uh, looking forward to see what's the difference, how things have moved forward. Over to you, Veda. Sure, thanks, Anil. Thank, thanks for those kind words, and uh, you know, thanks for the introduction. Uh, thanks, Anu, and to Tai Kerala for having me over and inviting me to the session. A big hello to all of the people who've turned up here today. I uh, hope all of you are safe and sound. Uh, your employees, colleagues, loved ones, everybody is safe and sound. Um, uh, so uh, today we have an interesting session. We have a session on um, influencer marketing, uh, which is a topic which is a little bit of a hot topic. It is a little bit, little bit of a debatable topic, slightly controversial topic. Uh, slightly misunderstood topic as well. Uh, so what we'll try and do today over the next, uh, I hope all of you are able to hear me all right, see me all right, see my screen, all of that is fine. Awesome. So today over the next, you know, I'll try to wrap up the content in say 40, 45 minutes or so. We'll leave the last 15, 20 minutes for question and answer. Uh, we'll try and understand what is influencer marketing first. Uh, we'll understand why is this needed. We'll understand some, uh, you know, key performance indicators that you need to measure to know if your influence marketing campaign is trending in the right direction. And then we'll get into the critical question, which is more practical, where for your business, how do you decide? First of all, I'll give you a sense of what are the various kinds of influencer marketing strategies and help you understand for your business, how do you determine what kind of strategies will actually work? How do you make that decision? Um, and then I'll take you through some case rates, examples, some from my experience, some from some of my observations uh, you know, that I have seen in the ecosystem. Uh, and then I'll also give you a sense of what are some popular influencer marketing platforms that you could use and leverage. Yeah. So uh, influencer marketing, like a lot of you would be aware of, it is a digital first and more importantly, a social media first approach that uh, essentially straddles that gray zone, that phantom zone, that thin dividing line between covert and overt forms of advertising, uh, the subtle versus the in your face forms of advertising. A lot of people, in fact, have taken the extreme step of questioning whether influencer marketing is just a, a newfangled term for something that's been happening all along, right? Is it just semantics, right? What is the difference between I sign up Amitabh Bachchan for my television, for my brand campaign? Uh, you know, how is that different from influencer marketing, right? A lot of people have this question. So, you know, it, the one of the biggest differences is in this word, right? The C word here, which is covert. Uh, in influencer marketing, usually, right? And there are always exceptions. Usually, uh, the forms of advertising are more covert, where the person comes through as an advocate of your brand without seeming like a ambassador or a paid spokesperson for your brand. While the person might still be getting money, right? Uh, it, 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 in the, the manner of communication and the manner in which it is delivered makes it appear genuine. That is one of the biggest differences. Uh, like I mentioned, it is part scientific. I think like unlike say performance marketing, I think some of you have attended some of the other sessions that I had conducted before on digital marketing and performance marketing, which is more scientific, which is more cookie cutter, which is more cut and dried. Uh, people have actually worked out the formula for success 
for the most part when it comes to performance marketing. So it is mostly scientific, very limited art. Whereas here it is still, a lot of it is still art. Some of it is scientific and people are still unlocking as we speak. And I'll take you through some examples of how brands are still very creatively uh, innovating on influencer marketing even today. Even today. So like, like you mentioned, influencer marketing is digital first, social media first. It is advertising, which is masquerading as editorial. Like I said, uh, uh, in, you know, I don't know some of you, if any of you have experience from the print world where you have this entire concept of an advertorial. I don't know if any of you have heard. Anybody has heard of this concept or this term of advertorial? You can raise your hands. I think Anil has heard. Uh, advertorial essentially is, uh, you know, coverage on your print publication or it could be even online, for example, which masquerades your editorial. You don't see, it doesn't seem like an advertisement. 20% off on buy juice, right? Uh, your kid will have your marks improved. Otherwise, you get all your money back. That's an advertisement. Right. Whereas here it's an actual editorial where you, let's say, for example, you have the interview of the CEO being featured, uh, you know, in that same strip, which is allocated for an advertisement. Uh, so for the lay person, for the untrained eye, it doesn't even appear like an advertisement. It appears like pure editorial content, which is one of the biggest differences. Um, and uh, of course, I mean, there are some rules in place, which are sometimes floated, wherein it, you know, the, the publication needs to have some something at least inserted, which gives the reader a clue that this is not editorial content, uh, right? Either the font needs to be different or it needs to be called out as a brand exclusive, for example. A lot of people don't understand what brand exclusive means, right? They'll see something written on the paper, they'll assume it's news and they'll assume it's editorial content. So, uh, so that was essentially something that was tried before in the social media world, it did advertising which masquerades editorial uh, done by people other than the brand. If I do the talking myself to Anil, Anil knows I am a brand which is speaking and walls start coming up subconsciously for Anil. But Anil trusts Anub. Anub is a good friend, right? Anub starts posting on my behalf and he says good things about me in a very seemingly natural fashion without it, me, without it appearing, the, you know, appearing very overtly that Anub has taken money from me, right? Then it appears... Uh, more organic and Anil has a greater propensity to trust Anub because Anub is somebody he trusts and respects. Uh, ROI measurement is still difficult from influence marketing, uh, which is still a challenge, but I'll take you through some hacks. Uh, and you can work with multiple kinds of influencers, micro, macro, or nano. And I'll help you understand for your business, what kind of influencers you need to work with, what kind of constructs. There are some cases where you don't pay them money, right? You just reward them in kind. There are some cases where the influencer has to be compensated in cash. There are multiple constructs and working models possible. It is a long-term play. Unlike say performance marketing, where you invest money today, you get results tomorrow. A good, bad, or ugly. You know whether it's working or not working, right? Influence marketing, you've got to be in it for a certain duration of time for you to start reaping the benefits. Uh, you know some of the uh, you know key statistics. Uh, you know just for for, for you to uh, you know get a sense in terms of why we are actually here. Uh, uh, you know uh, there is diminishing trust that a lot of people have uh, towards brands today. It's something that's clearly coming through. Um, and uh, which is the reason why influencers are here. The numbers speak for themselves. A lot of people said that they don't actually trust brand advertising. They trust the reviews which are done by influencers, bloggers, reviewers, etc. Et uh, but but the, uh, the interesting thing is if you're a brand, if you're on the other side of the fence, we spoke about what it is if you're a consumer, but as a brand, if you are choosing an influencer, you've got to be still cautious because India is unfortunately has the distinction of being amongst the top countries right after I think Mexico in terms of uh, social media or influence of fraud, wherein influencers essentially inflate their follower numbers in order to make, make themselves more appealing for a brand. Uh, you know, uh, so, uh, so which is a big problem because there are enough and more uh, you know, shady agencies, a lot of them from Central Asia, who essentially can increase your follower count to a million overnight by essentially having bots essentially follow you. Uh, it's, a very, it's not even real people, just, soft up, just, just a simple software program. Uh, so, uh, one of the things that you need to be careful of as an entrepreneur, as a brand, as a business is work with the right kind of influencers who's, who do not have inflated follower numbers. Some quick rules of thumb that I often advise is if you're working with an influencer, you see a huge follower count, but very limited engagement uh, on their posts. That's a red flag. Uh, or you see a lot of likes in a, in a, in a given post. But you see very limited con you know, comments or shares, which again is another red, red flag. Uh, you know, because it's very easy to game the, the, the follower and the likes, but not as easy to game comments and shares. Uh, so if you, if you see very limited comments and shares, again, that again is another yellowish red flag for you to uh, you know, consider. 
in terms of the key uh, you know metrics for success that i would recommend you measure one is obviously conversion but not immediately you've got to think of i don't know if i've mentioned this analogy before and i know that kerala is a football crazy state so uh, if you have a you know a defender who passes the ball to a midfielder who eventually passes it to the attacking person the attacker who scores the goal uh, and the attacker gets all the credit ronaldo takes away with all of the glory but uh, for that goal the midfielders and the defenders have also played a lot of uh, have contributed as well but quite often their name gets missed in a very similar fashion the marketing channels as well work together as a football team and that's something that you need to recognize uh, uh, very similar to how a football team operates you've also got various channels that work you know very closely with one another in conjunction uh, you've got facebook you've got google you've got performance marketing channels and you've got influencer marketing all of these work together in conjunction to make magic happen uh, quite often what happens is that when conversion which is the act of goal scoring in the metaphor that i mentioned when conversion happens it is usually your performance channels your brand channels that take away all the guts and the glory the influencer marketing channel does not get enough credit but quite often it would be it would have been that post that anil saw from anub that contributed to anil eventually clicking on my ad on google and converting so while you give credit to google you also need to measure over time to try and see if your influencer channels are actually contributing to your actual performance marketing channels as well engagement is another one so business results can be measured in multiple ways Uh, you also got to see what is the kind of engagement, you know, likes, shares, earned media that you're actually unlocking for your brand through your influencer marketing channels, through your influencer marketing efforts. That again is a key metric for you to measure. Brand buzz, mentions, uh, search keyword volumes, brand keyword search volumes, which is a clear indicator of how known or unknown is your brand. If there are five thousand searches every month for your core brand keyword, and that is increasing by ten percent every single month, and your brand awareness is growing, so that again is something for you to measure. hashtag mentions again so if let's say there is a particular let's say you are using influencers for a specific campaign which is a very short term plan we've used them in multiple use cases at health family for example we used to have this hashtag new year resolution campaign which we used to run at the start of every new year uh, around promoting Uh, new year resolution health health and fitness resolutions etc and for this we used used to work with a bunch of different influencers and the hashtag was hashtag new year resolution and uh, in simply run we had hashtag 2016 2015 2017 career wish which was the campaign that we promoted so you can see the number of hashtag mentions that come in because as a brand you own that property it is your turf in the digital world uh, so the number of people who actually mention that hashtag again is an indicator of how successful or unsuccessful your influencer campaign is like i mentioned at uh, like in the health family example at simply run as well we used to have this campaign at the start of every year where we used to source from the twitter rt social media users what were their career aspirations for the upcoming new year uh, we used to ask them to you know use this hashtag tweet out your career aspirations tag the brand simply learn so simply learn brand gets a lot of earned media coverage because you know th- tens of thousands of people are actually tweeting around this hashtag tagging the brand uh you know the number of hashtag mentions again is an indicator of the kind of brand awareness push that you've actually been able to make now uh, i'll i'll introduce you to you know three critical species in the entire in influencer marketing universe there is somebody called as a macro influencer who is a really large personality right uh, with a, with an enormous social media following usually and this is not a very hard definition anybody who has a million followers and above is considered to be a macro influencer million in terms of aggregate social media capital across all of their social media presences instagram tiktok you know twitter facebook linkedin all of that combined uh, youtube all of that combined if it is say a million and above you can consider it to be a macro influencer a micro influencer is somebody who hovers between you know the high thousands 7 8 10000 10, to all the way up to uh, you know to a million uh, uh, but they have like fantastic engagements their engagement levels are really really strong so it doesn't mean that if you got a low follower count you automatically become a micro influencer you also need to have very strong engagement levels engagement levels are defined as the numerator is the number of people who like share and comment on your post the denominator is your followers so if that number usually even if you are a macro influencer it's usually 1 or 2% uh, but if you want to be picked as a micro influencer macro influencers get picked for scale and reach I've got a million followers, and I'm a celebrity. I'm Rithik Roshan. I'm Amitabh Bachchan. Whereas a micro influencer typically gets picked because they have very strong engagement in the following that they own. Uh, for example, uh, you know, Anil could be a micro influencer. I could be a micro influencer because within my circle of influence, within Anil's circle of influence, within his loyal band of friends, followers, professional acquaintances, for all of the content, he may not have a million plus followers. He has maybe you know ten thousand followers. 
uh, within that loyal band of 10,000 followers, he gets like 10% plus engagement, which means that he's, he has a chance to be qualified as a micro influencer. Micro influencer essentially all the way from 10,000 to a million, but 10% plus engagement levels. Nano influencers are even much smaller, right? Who are sub early thousands, right? Less than 5,000, 3,000, 4,000 odd followers, but they get fantastic engagement. Uh, it could be that homemaker, uh, you know, who has like a fantastic following of people within her neighborhood, in her social media presence, in her social media universe, the space that she owns, but she gets engagement levels which are insane, 15, 20% plus, one out of every five people, right, uh, in her network actually like, share or comment all of the different posts she makes. That's an example of an Anna influencer. Now, as a brand, the key question is, uh, you know, which is the question which is top of mind for a lot of you is how do you decide? Uh, how, whom, whom I should work with and what kind of strategies I need to adopt. That becomes the key question. Now, I'll give you some simple frameworks now using which you can make these kinds of decisions for your business. Uh, the first one is this. You've got to think about what is the primary objective that you're looking to drive from your influencer marketing effort. Is it about driving credibility or is it about convenience, coolness, you know, aspirational uh, factor? What is it that you're really looking to drive? That's a key question that you need to ask yourself. Um, and the other key question is, are you looking for a short-term burst with a very specific tactical outcome or an end goal, or is it more long-term? And is it more always on and ongoing? Uh, and, on, and an ongoing effort for pushing the envelope on brand awareness. For example, the New Year campaign that I spoke about had a very specific shelf life. It was a campaign that ran specifically on the 1st of Jan and the 2nd of Jan, and that's it. It was a very short-term focused burst campaign uh, and the campaign finished in two days that is the shelf life of the campaign itself so we needed to have a different strategy than say a campaign which was more always on where we wanted to make sure that healthy family is seen as a trustworthy player as a credible player over the medium long term so you have different strategies for each of these different objectives now uh, this is something that i've managed to you know cull together based on my experience and uh, uh, not something that you would find, uh, uh, you know, on the in the public domain. But this is something that I have seen work in the companies that I have been a part of, and I have seen a lot of brands follow as well. If your primary focus is for driving credibility for your brand, if your brand to be seen, if you want your brand to be seen as a trustworthy player, a trustworthy partner, a trustworthy platform, and you're in it for the long term, then you're better off working with micro influencers and keeping your communication subtle, covert. Yeah, and I'll give you some examples of all of these as well. Now, if it's credibility, but it is a short-term campaign, it's a campaign with a very focused intent. Let's say, for example, at Health Family, we had a promotion for the World Yoga Day, which happens on a particular time of the year only. So it is a very short-term campaign, but still it is for driving credibility around the brand. So in that case, again, you use a combination of micro and macro influencers, but keeping it subtle. You might ask, why do I need macro influencers? I need the macro influencers because they give me that reach. It's a short-term campaign. I don't have time. It's a T20 game. It's an IPL game. So I need my Pollards. I need those heavy hitters. I need all of those West Indies big hitters. I need all of those guys. Plus, of course, I also need the guys who can work it around, take those singles, right? Who can drive engagement. So which is why I need a combination of micro and macro influencers. Plus, I need to keep it subtle. Now, if your key objective, however, is on driving coolness uh, for your brand to be seen as a head brand, uh, for you to drive, uh, you know, push the envelope on glamour portion for your brand, and it is a short term burst, then you're better off working with, you know, macro influencers and keeping it overt. Now, uh, this is a, you know, a, a philosophy that I have that if you're working with macro influencers in the influencer marketing space, it's a waste of time today in today's world for you to keep it covert because people 10 years ago, it was different, right? You could have Amitabh Bachchan sign up as an influencer for you and it could still be covert. People would not see through it because people are new in India to the game of digital and social and influencer marketing, which is what happened in the case of Kolaveri D, which went viral, right? There was a lot of influencer marketing push, which happened there under the hood. A lot of people didn't realize it, uh, but today people see through it. They know if a celebrity makes a post endorsing a brand, however subtle it is, people see through it for the most part because they know that this is a paid influencer. So which is why I feel it's actually a waste of time today for a macro influencer to actually keep it subtle. So of course there are exceptions, but for the most part, if it is a macro influencer, I don't go through the rigmarole of trying to keep it subtle. I try to keep it over. It's okay. 
uh, and sorry uh, now of course if it is uh, if it is on driving glamour portion uh, but you're in it for the long term then you work with a combination of both macro and micro influencers like i mentioned with macro influencers you keep it overt with micro ones you do keep it subtle uh, now, if it's micro influencers, so just to summarize, what do micro influencers bring to you? What value do they bring to your business? They help you build credibility. They see they, your business is seen as a credible one. It is best suited for long term objectives and it is you best used alongside subtle communication. A quick example, uh, you know, uh, just to reiterate the point that I'm looking to make here, I also did mention this. And I will mention this when you get to the Healthy Family case study. Uh, you know, Healthy Family, we work with a bunch of micro influencers only. We never work with big guys. Cult Fit, one of our biggest competitors, they always worked with macro influencers. They worked with people who already looked very good, right? Who had like massive fan following, a million soman, Rithik Roshan, people like these, right? Whereas we work with people who are like everyday people, like you and me, and uh, who had everyday stories to narrate. And we had very interesting slice of life narratives. Wow, I forgot to drink water the whole day. The Healthy Family app helped me, helped remind me, right? Wow, I forgot to, I was feeling so tired. I just did a set of Surya Namaskars. Uh, thanks to the Health Family app with some instructions, live instructions, I'm feeling so much better. I'm using the, I was in this Punjabi wedding, I was in this Kerala wedding, for example, with so much of rich food, seafood in front of me, I didn't know what to eat, I'm on a diet. But the Health, Health Family app actually helped suggest some really healthy eating options for me, keeping in mind my health goals. Uh, and thank you so much, Health Family. Essentially, simple, seemingly unscripted, natural narratives like these, where the person just takes a screenshot. Uh, from their phone and posts, which seems very natural, seems very unscripted, uh, seems very relatable. Those were the kind of communication pieces we focused on. Uh, macro influencers, they help position your brand as a cool one, as an aspirational one. Uh, and then they work, they again work for the long term, but they also work for short term, especially more so for short term and short term objectives. I want to promote that, uh, you know, I want, I want this video, music video to be promoted before I launch my movie. Right? I don't know how many of you, uh, the, the Arabic Kutu song, right? That went viral in the Beast movie. A lot of influencer marketing led push came in for that, right? You had people like Rashmika and, uh, you know, Varun Dhawan, totally unconnected to the movie. They were actually doing their own jigs and renditions of the song and they were posting it online and that went viral. That added to the buzz, uh, you know, around the song itself, which I, which, which I thought was fantastic uh, levels of, you know, fantastic ways, creative ways. And I'll talk to you about some more examples of how brands are becoming very, very creative in how they leverage macro influencers. Uh, and they work especially more so for short-term objectives. In this case, there was a movie release date before which I needed to build buzz. Or if it's a New Year campaign, uh, or it's a World Yoga Day campaign, which you're running. All of these have specific end dates. You can't just keep, keep you know, letting it run in perpetuity. And like I mentioned, subtle is a waste of time for the most part uh, with macro influencers. You might as well you know, keep it overt, it's okay. Just to give you some examples, uh, you know, Daniel Wellington, of course, a brand that needs no introduction, a very popular, uh, uh, you know, watch brand. Uh, they used a bunch of micro influencers and they kept it subtle because one of the biggest things that they wanted to drive was because it's a value for money brand. Uh, they wanted to make sure that trust and relatability were solved for, for their key demographic. So they needed influencers who looked like that target demographic persona, who looked like that millennial and not so much that, uh, that big actor or that macro influencer. Uh, my choice again a car rental platform again they worked with a bunch of different influencers uh, they worked with a combination of both micro and macro influencers and they played this delicate balancing act because not only did they want to drive trust and relatability they also wanted their brand to be seen as a cool as an aspirational one which is why they use this combination uh, nika of course a brand that needs no introduction uh, you know india's largest you know fashion beauty and fashion and beauty marketplace they work with a bunch of macro influencers primarily on youtube uh, who essentially put the word out. And obviously, given that they are in the fashion space, one of the biggest things that they need to solve for is glamour, glamour quotient. They want their brand to be seen as an aspirational one. So they worked with a bunch of different macro influencers on YouTube uh, who put out a lot of these great unboxing videos, for example, which essentially helps put the word out around the brand. Um, you know, Avis, again, a brand that needs to introduction, one of the world's leading rental companies. They work with a bunch of different micro influencers. They keep it overt for the most part, which is a little strange. I'm not passing judgment on their campaign, but that doesn't seem, that doesn't make sense for me, working with micro influencers and keeping it overt. Because if you want to work with micro influencers, you should keep it covert for the most part. Now, I'll give you a sense, a quick sneak peek into what were some of the things that we did at Health Family from an influencer marketing perspective. We had multiple use cases for using influencers. I'll take you through what was, you know, what those use cases were, what, what some of those use cases were. 
uh, one of the first ones was working with you know for promoting you know yoga events meetups world yoga day etc for these we worked primarily with micro influencers for the most part uh, we kept it overt because here we wanted the communication to be direct there was no beating around the bush in this case because even if i kept it covert i mean my objective here is to get anil and anub to come and attend that yoga day event that i'm going to be celebrating at you know kaban park in bangalore uh, there is no beating around the bush so i might as well keep it direct and overt uh, we had this new young mothers plan that we had launched which essentially was launched for moms who had recently given birth to children and who had put on a lot of excess body weight a lot of women go through that where they put on a lot of excess post pregnancy body fat lose confidence lose self esteem so for them specifically we had come out of the plan uh, you know for uh, you know better living weight loss etc and for that we were worked with a bunch of micro influencers who are again young mothers who had been through what these young moms have been through and they've actually seen benefits from actually using the program but we kept it subtle so one of the key things one of the other key questions that a lot of entrepreneurs ask me is how do you pick influencers uh you know to work with in your brand uh, you know with your brand one of the biggest things is you've got to pick people who are invested in your brand and who are not just mercenaries who are doing it for the money which is very important for example i'm a big fan of uh, this company whole truth foods i don't know how many of you have heard of this brand and they actually released this fantastic video a spoof video on how influencer marketing is today and uh, what is the kind of what are the kind of influencers they are in fact looking to recruit going forward and i think that's a fantastic video that they actually put out and uh, something that i totally endorse and i believe in as well and uh, something that we used to follow in the family where we picked people for example even in this case the young mothers that we worked with as micro influencers uh, you know paid micro influencers but the ones that we worked with we actually had them use our product and service for a few months see the benefit from it we wanted them to be invested in the platform's efficacy the brand's efficacy before coming in and signing on board as an influencer that was something that we were very keen on uh, uh, the other thing was ria ria is you know uh, was the virtual ai powered virtual chat nutritionist that we used to offer at health family and uh, for promoting and socializing ria again we used a combination of uh, you know we used primarily micro influencers but we kept it subtle because here again we wanted we wanted to solve for trust and reliability for the most part key features of the health family app again we used a lot of micro influencers for the first one the yoga events and meetups we also used a lot of macro influencers the hashtag new year campaign here we used a combination of micro and macro influencers we used macro influencers here more so because we wanted to amplify the word we wanted this to be a big bang marquee campaign and we had a very limited time window so i needed my pollard i needed my andre russell to hit those sixes in a very short time so which is why we used with mac we used macro influencers as well now just to give you some example like i mentioned brands are continuing to innovate uh, in the influencer marketing space i've noticed some like the arabic kuttu song promotions by a bunch of different uh, you know a bunch of different inf macro influencers there was this other cool thing that happened where vikram vera very popular uh, you know tamil movie which was released uh, you know more, i think 7 8 years ago probably was first in malayalam i'm not sure but it certainly was a very popular tamil movie it's been recently remade in hindi in bollywood and uh, featuring saif ali khan right and what happened was you know karina kapoor actually made this post saying her husband is looking very hot and it seems like a very natural post but this is actually another very interesting way of leveraging a macro influencer who is not connected to the brand who is not connected to the karina kapoor has nothing to do with that movie but she is but she has a personal connection with one of the key people involved in the movie which is saif ali khan right and she managed to post something about how saif ali khan is looking in that movie without making a direct reference so this again is a, this seems organic but it's not another example was this a lot of people would have seen and enjoyed the indira nagar ka gunda video right rahul dravid in the cred ad uh, you know virat kohli actually posted it saying i have never seen this angry side of rahul bhaiya right uh, that uh, it seemed organic but it's not right <laughs> i can assure you again a very i i mentioned earlier that it, macro influencer marketing has to be covert there is no point in keeping it overt but these are two examples along with the arabic kutu example that i spoke about uh, of uh, you know of brands actually using very innovative forms of using macro influencers not connected to that actual property but linking but bringing in that personal connection with somebody actually involved in that engagement and you know do you know doing it in a very creative fashion now if you were to think of some hypothetical situation we can have some fun now let's say that and i would love to hear based is what you've learned today in the session i would love to hear feedback in the chat as well what would you do you know in some of these situations if you were the entrepreneur if you were the brand manager if you were the influencer marketing manager 
uh, who was tasked with these challenges, how would you approach it? Let's say LACME has launched a line of new fairness creams. And they want to leverage, you know, influencers and influencer marketing for actually promoting and putting the word out. What kind of strategy would you adopt? You could enter your responses in the chat. Would you use macro, micro influencers? Would you keep it overt, covert, subtle? What would you do? Just enter your responses in the chat, please. And let's say before I jump on to the next one, let's assume that LACME has launched a new line of fairness cream specifically for teenagers. Just to make it more interesting, just to spice it up. First is LACME is not a line of generic fairness cream. Second one is specifically for teenagers, they've launched something. Any ideas? Uh, let me see. I'm seeing some responses. Karishma says covert, micro influencers, micro and macro overt. Interesting. So in this case, uh, I'll tell you what I would have done. Uh, and I'm not saying that is the only way to do it or the right way to do it, but basis, uh, the frameworks and the strategy that I have seen work in my, you know, work in the past, uh, these would be my recommendations. In this case, if it's a fairness cream, again, you primarily want to solve for trust and relatability. So in this case, I would use, if it is a generic cam, if it is a generic cream, I would use micro influencers. I would keep it subtle. Uh, if it is say specifically targeting teenagers, for example, uh, if it is targeting teens, which requires that level of jazziness, the product to be jazzed up that much more, I would use macro influencers as well and keep it overt if needed. Uh, in the health family case, let's say health family launches, health family is not into mental wellness. It is only into physical fitness and nutrition led wellness. Uh, you know, physical wellness, but if healthy family were to get into the mental wellness place, uh, mental wellness space, uh, and it wants to launch its new line of mental wellness products, what kind of a strategy do you think you would use? Keep in mind that mental wellness is a very sensitive topic, right? It's a, it's a taboo topic still in our country. A lot of people don't like to discuss about it. Uh, and uh, let's say there is a company that is actually launching a new mental wellness product line. Uh, how would it go about you know, promoting it using influencers? Interesting. So in this case, Priya believes that you can use micro, macro and keeping it subtle. At least I'm of the opinion that I'm not saying this wrong. I'm just telling you what my opinion and suggestion is. Uh, and in this case, I would use primarily micro influencers and nano influencers uh, and, uh, and keep it as subtle as it can get. Uh, because here again, like I said, it's a very sensitive topic needs to be handled with sensitivity. Uh, you can't have, maybe you could get a Deepika Padukone, for example, who has herself been through mental depression and she's come out of it. Maybe have somebody like her uh, as an exception, as a macro influencer that you could still use, but no point in getting in somebody generic just for the sake of their reach and trying to promote this particular product line. The next example is sure Priya. Thanks. Uh, she was actually thinking of Deepika. Uh, so next is, let's say Ola launches, uh, uh, you know, a, a line of luxury rentals. Let's say that, for example, using your app, you could book a Jaguar. You could book a, a Rolls Royce. Uh, what would you do? Absolutely. Ayush is right. Overt, uh, you know, macro influencers, right? That's the way to go in this particular case, because it's all about glamour. Next is Haldirams has launched a new sugar-free product line, right? A, a company that is known for selling sugar uh, is now a legacy brand, a heritage brand. I personally am a big fan of Haldirams. I love their namkeens and sugars and everything. I don't know how popular it is in Kerala, but I'm a big fan of Haldirams. Uh, what would you do? Macro plus micro over interesting. In this case, I believe, at least this is my suggestion. In this case, I think Haldirams needs to get people to cross that trust divide. Now, a company that sells sugar is promoting a sugar-free brand. That in itself seems like a, a paradox. It seems like a little bit of an oxymoron, the, the entire sentence, if you had to think of it as a word. And uh, in this case, I would use like, uh, you know, Sujit has actually mentioned uh, my suggestion. I'm not saying it's the right way, but it is the only way. At least what I would do is I would use micro-influencers and I would keep it covert. Uh, because trust and relatability need to solve for who's going to buy this. It's not the guy with the sweet tooth, 
right? Who's going to be buying these products is the person who's very careful about their health. The person who's already diabetic. These are the people who are actually going for the sugar-free product line. Either the health conscious person or the person who's already sick, who already has diabetes, right? These are the people who are going to buy. For them, you need to be, you need to handle it with sensitivity and you need micro influencers to come in in order to handle that. The other one, let's say cult fit this should be an easy one because I told you what Healthy Family did. Cult fit wants to drive registrations for the upcoming World Yoga Day. So here again, it would be, you know, uh, macro influencers because you've got a very limited time window. You use macro influencers, keep it over. Now, giving you a bunch of popular platforms, uh, you know, for uh, discovering influencers, working with influencers, setting up influencer marketing campaigns. Uh, now, there are multiple ways. One of the basic questions that I'm often asked by a lot of entrepreneurs, how should I go about, uh, you know, identifying influencers? Where do I find them? Should I do it myself? Should I work with an agency? Should I work with a, you know, a platform? Now, there are multiple things you can do. Uh, uh, you know, first of all, I'll give you a sense of the platform. Then I'll tell you what I think you should do, what I would do if I were you. Uh, these are some platforms which essentially serve as two-sided marketplaces. On the one side, you've got an advertiser like yourself, right, which is the company which is looking for influencers. And on the other side, you've got the actual influencer themselves, right? You've got the actual influencers themselves who have built up a lot of social capital. Now, these people essentially act as matchmakers. Now, let's say Anil is a, is a person who's an entrepreneur who runs a health tech company, right, focused in which sells products and services to people in Southeast Asia, for example, or Middle East. Uh, so he puts in the filters there as target geography, customer demography, uh, you know, what kind of uh, industry he's looking for, et cetera, all of that. He enters all of that. And the system will actually, in return, give him a bunch of suggestions on what are the kind of influences that he need to work with. Uh, in some cases, you know, a lot of these are freemium platforms. So they will give you a taste of some influencers, though, without revealing their contact details or just reveal some names without giving you the complete names. You can't download or export any information. Once you become a premium subscriber, it's fairly cheap. You can actually go ahead and download their contact information. Some of them also have built-in workflow capabilities. So you can directly get in touch with the influencer via the platform. And the platform would also do the commercial negotiation for you. It's usually a set commercial, which is set in, but you can also negotiate a la carte over and above that. My own personal recommendation from all of this has always been view role and affluence, which I think have a good coverage of Indian influencers as well. A lot of them are, a lot of the others have more you know, global influencer presence, but not so much on Indian influencers. Now, coming back to what I would do if I were an influence, if I were an early stage entrepreneur like yourself, is I would try to handpick. I would not outsource this to an agency. Uh, you could use a, a you know a platform like this, but before you do that, I always believe that a platform is stage two. In your stage one, you should yourself look to handpick and curate your own influencers. You need to decide who are the kind of influencers whom you want to work with. And that I think is very essential. Uh, in the like in the health family case, like I mentioned, we what we used to do was we used to personally vet, look at the social media profiles of a lot of these influencers, have a long interview uh, with a lot of these influencers, make them actually fill out a questionnaire, help them have them actually experience our product and service, and uh, you know give give out and and uh, we want them wanted them to be invested in the brand's philosophy, the brand's vision, the value proposition, and the efficacy of the brand before we signed them on board as an influencer. And we did not want to outsource this to an agency. A bunch of influencer marketing agencies came and gave us their pitches. But we initially, we did the selection curation of influencers ourselves. Over time, we also started working with some of these platforms. Because what are the, once you start scaling your influencer marketing engine, you may not have the time and the bandwidth to handpick and cherry pick every single influencer yourself. What these agencies do is they do the vetting themselves in a lot of cases. So they usually, of course, there will be people who still see, you know, uh, you know, fall through the cracks. They usually separate the wheat from the chef and you, the fraudsters, the people who have like bloated up follower ratings, et cetera, followers, et cetera, they are usually filtered out. That's all I had for you today. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, love to take any questions that you might have. Fantastic with that. Phenomenal. Like, you know, gave a complete overview of, uh, uh, you know, the influence of marketing, it is, like you rightly said, it's trending at this point in time. Sure, thanks. Yeah, um, I think uh, there is a question. Um, this is from Karishma, which what she says is, what would you suggest the right way to use influence of marketing for promoting events or festival? So Karishma, in this case, right, very similar to what we used to do for promoting Yoga Day, I would recommend that you use a similar approach. Now, the, the question is, how soon before the event are you beginning promotions? If you're beginning very, very early, by early, I mean three, four months prior, you still can use micro-influencers. 
But if you're say a month, couple of months before the event and you are like desperate for driving registrations for the event, you can drop all pretenses and work directly with macro influencers and keep it over time. Okay. Hope that helps. Wish you all the best. Uh, another question is like, you know, if you look at from a startup perspective, right, you would have people working on the consumer side, people working on the deep tech and technology side, right? So for example, let's say a startup vertical, which is primarily on AR, VR, AI, you know, those type of things. So do we have some influencers for that specific segment as well? What's your experience there? So it's an interesting question. See, influencers, when people talk about influencer marketing, something that I should have mentioned before, it is primarily B2C first. B2C. Uh, for B2B, it is a little difficult. Uh, the only case where I have seen it actually work, I mean, there are a couple of examples I can give you. One is at uh, some, some, a lot of people don't realize it. Simply Learn, while well, it's a very popular B2C company, also has a B2B division where we used to sell corporate learning solutions. We worked mm-hmm. with a bunch of these course advisors who, who are like these global thought leaders and experts uh, who would come in and conduct a program, you know, make some social media posts write a blog article, et cetera, for the students, and which is part of the deal. And it was a barter deal. So that, let's say, Anil, you are a thought leader that I work with from digital marketing. I will also promise to promote your brand using my marketing channels. It's a barter deal between us. Now, that is one way. And we also extended that to our B2B offering. And for example, at Microsoft, again, uh, you know, we have this MVP program, Most Valuable Player program, where we work with a lot of very, very popular technologists around the globe. Uh, And they serve as ambassadors for the brand. Uh, you know, that's another way for you to actually uh, do this in the B2B world. In the B2B world, again, you've got to be very careful from making it a very crass commercial arrangement. Uh, mm-hmm. So you've got to work with these global thought leaders who will come forward as advisors, as endorsers without any obligation, who are who are genuinely invested in the success of your brand, who believe in your brand's efficacy, your platform strength, uh, who believe in, for example, in the AI example that you said, they genuinely believe in the strength of your AI algorithm. For example, and you've got a global thought leader endorsing. So if you can have that, and you need to have a very cool term for it, right? Like, for example, at Microsoft, you have the MVP program, or it could be, say, uh, an evangelist program or an ambassador program. It needs to be something like that. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think that's what you need to do, you know, in the B2B space. That's a very interesting question. Correct. Um, this is another question from Jaydeep. Uh, in B2B, how impactful are the Twitter or LinkedIn influencers? Yeah, like I mentioned in B2B, Jaydeep, uh, it's an interesting one. Uh, so if you're, it depend, I, I didn't understand, are you selling to SMEs and startups? So if you're selling to SMEs and startups, that changes things. So when I said B2B, I meant a company like say a Microsoft, for example, that sells to large enterprises for the most part. Of course, it also sells to SMEs and startups, but it sells to large or an Infosys or a Cognizant that sells to large enterprises by definition. Which is the which is B2B, which is why the standard definition of B2B. When you're selling to a startup or an SME, it is a little bit of a strange animal. Because an SME or a startup is not necessarily high-end straight jacketed B2B, nor is it completely swiggy zomato style B2C. But the marketing playbooks you need for being successful when you're selling to this customer persona is very close to the B2C end of the spectrum. So, which means that you could still use influencers just like a B2C brand would and drive success. For example, at Razorpay, we used to work with Anpur Bariku a lot. Yeah. And uh, who was a very, like a lot of you know, is a very, very popular LinkedIn influencer and, uh, and on Twitter as well. And, uh, and he worked with us because he just absolutely loved the brand. And uh, we had this ambassador program going on as well. So in your, the short answer to your question, Jaydeep, is yes, you can do it if you do it well. Uh, the short answer is yes. I just gave you an example. At Razorpay, we primarily sell to SMEs and startups. And we worked with a bunch of different influencers. Ankur Variko is an example. Hope that answers your question, Jaydeep. Wish you all the best. Great, great. Uh, with another question, uh, which is in the mind of the startup, you know, the entrepreneurs are, you know, you you, you said that the influencers uh, are there available. And specifically, when you talk about Nano, which is a focused niche, you know, they've got a small uh, sort of a community there, right? But uh, how do, oh, like, an entrepreneur, identify this nano yeah nano is difficult uh, anil you've got to curate it yourself uh, and you've got to do you've got to search for it yourself uh, i mean you could still use these platforms because nano micro is still okay right micro influencers will still be less you can put filters right on that platform saying i want to look for people only with 10000 followers or below engagement rates above this okay. which is by definition your micro influencer Right. So uh, basically, I don't want big shots, but I want people who are smaller fishes, 
but who have like large influence within their circle of influence. Uh, essentially, a big fish in a small pond, right? Mm-hmm. That essentially is what I need. But, uh, but I if it is a nano, it gets difficult. You'll have to do it yourself. Uh, okay. Short answer is I, I, at least I have not. It's very difficult for you to figure it out because they are not people who are looking to monetize a social capital. All right, right. They don't even realize that they are sitting on potential monetization opportunities. So you've got to reach out to them. You've got to figure them. You and your team have to figure it out. Or if you have an agency partner, you've got to figure it out and reach out to them. Does this platforms have hyper local influencers? You know, you can look at it like you know this particular in Bangalore. I want. Yeah, to by know. geography you can certainly do it. So geography mm-hmm. filter is available. Okay. Uh, it goes all the way down to city as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, even geography for their followers. I want the influencer based in this region. What what matters to you more than the job? Influencer geography is the geography of their followers. Okay. Right. So yeah. you can put those filters in. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if it is a nano influencer where their follower base is so small. They will not even be listed on these platforms, so you'll have to do the search manually. Okay. Uh, with another question, which is in the mind of most of the entrepreneurs, is you know what would be your conversion rates in generic? You know, let's look at uh, consumer space, FMCG product influencers. What is the type of uh, generic market conversion or engagement rate that we should look at? Ballpark, if you can just share that. Not Which specific to influencer marketing in general. Yeah, in general, influencer marketing in general, like you know, if you if, let's say if I as I start up, you know, engage with. I mean, they're very difficult to give a generic answer there, Anil. But, it but category wise, category to category. Possible. But if it is category say regular, I, just to give you an example, in the health tech space, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, at Health Family, for example, the the mm-hmm. usual conversion rate between free to premium users was in the low single digits. Um, okay. And uh, which is for and for the brand channels, it was high single digits. So if it is coming through a brand keyword, etc. Uh, so for influencer marketing, it was even lower because from that channel itself, it will always be low by definition. Like I said, right? If you, I'm, I'm, you are an influencer. You made a post from your UTM parameter, from your unique personalized link. If I were to track conversions, it will be lower. Right. But what you need to track is over time, from the time before I started influencer to the time after I started influencer marketing, what has been the impact across my marketing channels? That is the real impact that influencer marketing brings in. And what has been the increase in your brand keyword search volume, social media mentions, all of that. Okay, great. Now, among the among the, all the trends that you have, you know, the digital marketing influencer, uh, you know, all those type of things. As a as a marketing uh, expert or guru, uh, you know, how would you recommend a startup? You know, what should be as a young uh, entrepreneur pick it up? You know, should the influencer marketing should be that we should focus on our digital marketing? What is, what would be your advice to them? So something that I mentioned in one of my earlier chats, Anil, is that if I am in their position, uh, what I would do is I would not spend a lot of money on paid marketing unless there are some specific constraints. I need to show mm-hmm. growth within this quarter or I need to that, I need that initial set of early adopters to validate my product market fit assumptions. Uh, unless there are, you know, specific pressing time constraints like these, what I would do is I would Focus on content, focus on SEO to begin with and focus on creating earned media for the brand. Uh, and over time, be very careful in picking influencers and handpick influencers who are invested in the brand, who are invested in the brand okay. philosophy. That will be my recommendation. Have experiments okay. with paid marketing, but uh, never be completely dependent on paid marketing. Okay. Another question Veda, from Hima is, you know, what would you recommend for a wellness hospital? which is into integrated functional medicine. I think they're very similar to what a healthy family has done. I think trust and relatability is something that you need to solve for. Uh, okay. And uh, as opposed to glamour, which is why I would recommend working with, uh, you know, micro influencers, keeping it covert for the most part. Uh, for example, at healthy family, like I said, right, we used to use, look for these everyday slice of life moments where mm-hmm. we have these influencers talking about how healthy family made a difference in their day for putting right. the word out. That's what I would suggest. Wish you all the best. Okay. Another question from one of our uh, participants is basically, typically when you think about a nano influencer, is there any market? Because I know that, you know, the charges of the influencers are very varied, right? So do you have a ballpark or some suggestive numbers where a nano influencers charge? Is it possible for a revenue share model? Right. We, do they work on those models? It's you could try it out revenue share if you could be successful, but uh, so if, just to give you a sense, Working with a, we worked with like uh, almost 50 nano influencers for like, uh, I think six, seven lakhs for the entire young mom's plan. So you can do the math. So I think it per person, it comes to how much? 
seven lakhs by fifty is three thousand. Sorry, thirty thousand, right? Thirty thousand, thirty thousand. Yeah, approximately. So approximately, right? So that's for like three posts in a month. That essentially was the match. So it works out to approximately ten thousand bucks per post. Uh, that was something that we had worked out. If it is a mac, if it's a macro influencer, it's going to be enormously costly. For example, so so the going rate for a, a tweet by Ratik Roshan would be multiple tens of lakhs, close to a crore. So, hmm. so <laughs> very true. Questions. Expensive. And uh, another question from one of the participants is: uh, Is there a need to make an agreement with them? Do you typically they sign up an agreement, yeah. or is that so? Yeah, you you need to. I mean, at least on email for the so that the commercials are ironed out, etc. But uh, any a commercial arrangement is always better. Oh, okay. Uh, another question. Agreement is a contractual Sri agreement is always better. Right. Thanks, Vela. Uh, another question from Sri Jesh Shivan is: you know, How to engage with influencers for a social enterprise? How influencer marketing will be helpful in a social enterprise? With thin gap between top and bottom line, how do you weigh? I think if it's a social enterprise again, I think use the same philosophy that I mentioned earlier. With minus the commercial compensation, where you work with people who are invested in your cause and who are willing to, because you are not looking to make money. So usually, what I have noticed, obviously there will be some influencers who who, who don't who don't care about the cause; they just want um, mm -hmm. you know the money on the table. But there will be a lot of influencers that you can work with who are invested in your philosophy, invested in your cause, who believe. In your social cause and would be willing to join hands with you. Those are the people you need to work with. Okay. Um, another question is: Is it correct to categorize influencer marketing under inbound marketing? Like no, it's not inbound. No, it's not inbound. It is very much outbound. It's outbound, right? Yeah, that's outbound, outbound, but more subtle. That's the only difference, like I said. More subtle. More subtle. Fantastic. Thanks a lot. With a lot of questions. Is there any other questions, please? Uh, uh, we would rarely get Veda's time. He's a pretty busy man. So, you know, you get an opportunity now to ask questions. Uh, that's a very interesting topic. Uh, any other questions, dear friends? Great, great, great. So, uh, I think, uh, Veda, thanks a lot. I think uh, the team has really got a very good insight about the new trending, you know, tool, which is influencer marketing, you know, and the way you uh, articulated it, you know, when, how, how much was phenomenal. Uh, I think uh, uh, if, um, the, if the product marketing team members are already here, they would have got a very good uh, sort of a inroad in terms of what should they pick it up, whether it be they should pick it up a macro or a micro or a nano, right? And the examples that you gave were really phenomenal. Um, you know, thanks a lot for sparing the time for Thai Kerala and we always cherish your participation your knowledge uh, thank you very much and all the best and uh, see you up growing as we as we grow as well right thanks a lot thank you very much all the participants for being here sure. and appreciate you your time sure thank you so much anil and to talk kerala for inviting me wish all of the participants uh, here good health uh, you know take care and uh, stay safe and wish you all success in your yeah. uh, respect and a happy weekend though happy, yeah, happy weekend, weekend. Well. Yeah. Bye. thanks thanks Vida. thanks anup we'll conclude now Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.